स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Today we will start talking about the Silo theorems. So let me first recall uh, two results that we spoke about in our previous videos. So the first one was the proposition we started out with which is that if G is a group which acts on a set X both G and X being finite and if G turns out to be a P group P is a fixed prime and uh, x is uh, the cardinality of x is not divisible by p then there exists a fixed point for the action okay and the set of fixed points is non empty so this was the first thing that we proved by analyzing orbits and stabilizers and so on the second one is uh, was one of our applications of this basic fixed point principle which said that if i take uh, any two numbers n and r natural numbers then the binomial coefficient p n choose p r is congruent to the binomial coefficient n choose r modulo p ok. So, these were two the results and I am sort of recalling them specifically because I am going to use both of them uh, together. So, uh, let us begin. So, what I first want to ask is uh, sort of the following converse if you will to this this proposition here. So, here is a converse question. So, converse to this proposition. So, maybe we should just give this a name for now. Let me call this proposition A. So, I want to know what can I say about the converse to proposition A. Is there a converse? Okay. In other words, uh, can I say something about uh, suppose I have so okay let us let us try and formulate a, a reasonable converse here. So, let me make some hypotheses. So, let me call this proposition B. So, again I will I will make these blanket assumptions that P is a prime G and X are finite sets and uh, G is a group acting on the set X. So, for proposition B. Uh, let me formulate it as follows. Uh, let P divide the cardinality of G first. Okay. So, let me assume that the, the group cardinality is divisible by P. Now, suppose we have the following property that whenever this group G acts on a set X whose cardinality is not divisible by P, then it always has fixed points. Okay. So, it acts in such a way that it always has every action on a, a set whose cardinality is not divisible by p every such action has a fixed point ok. So, suppose the group has this property. So, let p divide the cardinality of g suppose it is true that for all finite sets x. So, let me call it finite g sets recall that means that there is an action of the group G on the set X. Suppose it is true that for all finite G sets X uh, such that P does not divide its cardinality, we have X G is not empty. Okay. In other words, every such action has fixed points. Then can I conclude that G is a P group? then G I want to claim is in fact a P group. Okay. So, observe if G is a P group then this is the proposition A says exactly this I mean says that on every such set X whose cardinality is not divisible by P uh, the action of G will have fixed points. Okay. So, we are sort of asking the converse question. If we know this property or uh, the fixed point property of actions then is it necessarily true that G is a P group ok. And for this of course, I, I will assume that P divides the cardinality of G that is sort of the first uh, uh, main assumption ok. Um, we will prove this this 
statement by sort of first rephrasing it. So, it turns out that this is in fact true and let us prove this. To prove this, uh, let us rephrase it in its contrapositive form. So, what does that mean? Uh, we will show suppose g is not. So, in some sense proof by contradiction if you wish. Suppose g is not a p group. Okay. But remember the cardinality of g was divisible by p. So, if you write out what the cardinality of g looks like, p will be one of the factors. Okay. And of course, it can occur to some power, right? Uh, cardinality could be divisible by p, p square, p cubed and so on. There will always be some highest power of, of p which divides the cardinality. So, let me call that d. So, what is d here? d is the highest power, highest power of p such that p power d divides the cardinality of the group. And uh, of course, if I write out the prime factorization of g of the cardinality of g in addition to p power d, then what I will start seeing next is a bunch of you know powers of other primes not, not p itself, but other primes. So, let me not uh, write out the entire prime factorization. Let me just call the that product of powers of other primes as the number m. Okay. So, uh, what is m here? Well, m is a number that is at least 1 and observe m is essentially the product of uh, prime powers other than p. So, of course, m is co-prime to p. In other words, p does not divide the number m. Okay. So, uh, any, any uh, number can always be written in this way, but I, I still have not incorporated this assumption. I am saying suppose g is not a p group. So, what does that mean? It says when I write the cardinality of g in this way, the number m cannot be 1. Okay. So, if the number m is 1, then of course, it just means that the cardinality of g is p power d. Okay. So, here is what I know that m is not 1, m is at least 2. Okay. So, this is what we conclude from the fact that from the assumption that g is not a p group. Okay. Now, uh, let us see what do we need to do in order to prove the proposition. So, let me go back to the statement of proposition b. Okay. So, it says uh, suppose it is true that for all finite g sets x such that p does not divide the cardinality, we have uh, x g is not empty, then g is a p group. Right? So, to prove this, I am saying suppose g is not a p group, then what I will do is I will produce a, a finite g set x. What we need to do is to produce a finite g set x whose cardinality is not divisible by p such that x g is empty. Okay. So, this is what we would need to do in order to complete the proof. So, need to construct a finite g set x with p not dividing its cardinality and such that there are no fixed points. Okay. If I can do this, then I would have obtained a contradiction and therefore, my original assumption would have been wrong and therefore, the proof would be complete. Okay. So, what I really need to do is the following. So, if g is not a b group, then I should be able to construct an action of g uh, you know on a set x such that there are no fixed points. In other words, I need to construct a fixed point free action. Okay. So, such an action let us just give this a name. So, I, I would like to say that this sort of action is what is called fixed point free meaning there are no fixed points here okay. or fixed point less if you wish. Okay, so, uh, let us uh, let us analyze such actions for a little while. So, notice the key point here is we also need this condition. There are two conditions we need to satisfy. Number one, the cardinality should not be divisible by p and secondly, there should be no fixed points. Okay. Now, so, so this condition is what is what I want to call fixed point freeness. Okay. Now, uh, what is the next thing? Let us show that um,
Um, okay, so let's let's analyze fixed point free actions for a little bit. So what are some examples of fixed point free actions? Examples of uh, fixed point free actions. Okay, so let me assume my group G is fixed. So G is my given finite group. Now there's always a, a very nice action uh, which we have looked at before, which is a group acting on itself by sort of left multiplication by multiplication. So how does the group G act in this case? G acting on the group element G1 is just the product G G1. Okay, so here G and G1 are both elements of the group. So the, the group and the set are in some sense the same. So I think of this as my set X on which my group acts, just acts by left multiplication. And the interesting thing about this is that this is a fixed point free action. Okay, so let's check that. What are the fixed points for this action? So if I have a fixed point, so suppose I uh, let me call uh, an element G1, let's say, if it is a fixed point for this action, if I have a fixed point, then what does that mean? it says that G acting on G1 is G1 for all group elements G and G. Okay? But that just means that the product G G1 equals G1. But this necessarily means and remember this should hold for all group elements G and G. Now what does that mean? That just means that well I can after all it is a group so I can cancel. I have cancellation on both sides. So it means G must be the identity element. Okay? But remember this, this equation is supposed to hold for all group elements. Uh, G in G, okay. But what we have just shown is it can only possibly hold for the identity element of G, okay. So observe, but uh, remember we know that G is not the identity group. Remember that G is not just an element, uh, the group with a single element, since we have already assumed that it's divisible by some prime number, right? So this is, in other words, cardinality of G is necessarily two or more. So surely there exists an element other than the identity in the group. Okay? Therefore, I can always find an element G in G other than the identity. Okay? And also for that element, I, I get a contradiction here. Okay? So therefore, uh, I can't have, so what, what do I mean? There exists an element G in G, so that G is not equal to 1. For that G, G, G1 cannot equal G1. Okay. So, therefore, G1 cannot be a fixed point, therefore, G1 cannot be. Okay. So, in other words, I cannot have any fixed points for this action. Okay. So, therefore, we conclude that under the hypothesis that the group is not the identity group, um, the left multiplication action is fixed point free. Okay. So, this is one example. Now, um, here is another important example that will that will come up again. So this has already occurred in our, our previous video. So this is what we had called action on subsets. Okay. So what is the general setting here? If I have a group which acts on a set X, then from this I can construct a new action of the group G uh, on subsets of X. Okay, so on the power set, what we call the power set of X, this is the set of all A such that A is a subset of X. Okay, so I can construct an action on subsets and what is the action? Well, it is just the element wise action. So recall again that the action on subsets is defined like this, G a group element acting on a subset A. So here A is assumed to be a subset of the original set X. How does G act on this subset A? It just acts element wise. You, you, it's the uh, set consisting of G dot A, where A ranges over all elements of A. Okay, so this is going to be a new subset, and this is the this is the action G acting on A produces this new subset, which is just the element wise action on the original subset. And observe, we had used this in fact to prove that uh, uh, the congruence that P N. Um, choose P R is congruent to N choose R mod P by sort of analyzing the action on dots in a grid and looking at subsets of dots and so on. So, this is a general formalism. Whenever you have an action on a set, you also have automatically an action on subsets of that set. So, let us apply this to the, to the particular case. So, let us take the example 
uh, of the previous action. Suppose I take my set x to also be the group G. Okay. In other words, I look at G acting on G by the multiplication by left multiplication. Now this action Well, what are its, uh, uh, well, okay, now I want to look at the action now on subsets of G. So, for the action on G, I have just said there cannot possibly be fixed points, but what about for the action on subsets of G? Can I have fixed points there? Okay, so let us analyze that action. So, let us call this, this new set as um, uh, Y maybe. Now, let us ask what is YG? In other words, which subsets of G are invariant under this action? Okay. So let us observe uh, what, what, what do we have. So suppose I have a subset. So suppose I have a fixed point. Then what property must that fixed point satisfy? Then it means G dot A must equal A. This should be true for all group elements G and G. Okay. In other words, on the left hand side, I have uh, the product G A as G belongs to G sorry as a belongs to a as a ranges over a and on the right hand side i just have the original set a itself okay now what does this mean so this is the property i want uh, to be true so maybe it's easiest to just draw a figure here so let me imagine this is my group g Okay, and I have a certain subset A of the group. So, here is my subset A. Now, what I am saying is that if I take these elements of A and I multiply all of them by a single group element G, no matter which one, the answer is again the same dots. Okay, meaning when I when I hit this dot by an element of G, it probably it could become some other dot. Okay, but it does not leave the group. So, uh, where I, it does not leave the subset A. Okay? So, when I when I multiply G with elements of A, I just get back elements of A again. Okay? So, that is sort of what, what this is saying. Okay? Now, uh, observe again that this is not, this is very easy to, uh, to violate. For example, suppose I take an element B here. Okay? So, suppose, so here is my, uh, here is my conclusion. Let us analyze this. Suppose A is not the whole set G. Okay? Then pick some element B which is outside A. Okay? So, that is that's in the, the green dot in the picture, a point which is not in A. Now, observe that suppose I take any point A in A, I can always map it to B. So, let us call this, take any one point A in A. I claim you can find a group element which will, uh, when acting on A, it will give you B. Okay. Now, observe there always exists a group element G in G such that G when acting on A will give me B. Okay. And why? Well, that element is namely the element G equals uh, B A inverse, right? Because recall this action of G on A was just the action by left multiplication. So, if I multiply A on the left by B A inverse, of course, the answer is B, okay? So, if I take this particular group element G, it maps A to this element B, which is outside A, okay? So, what does that mean? It says that there cannot really exist any subset A which is uh, a fixed point for this action okay? because I can always find an appropriate group element which will take a point A which is inside this subset to a point B which is outside this subset. Okay? So, what does that mean? This means observe A cannot be a fixed point. Okay? So, this was under the assumption that A was not the whole set. right? So, uh, this analysis, you can try and convince yourselves that this analysis actually proves the following. So, here is our conclusion. It says that if I have any proper non-empty subset of, of G, it cannot be a fixed point for this action. In other words, the only fixed points are, well, the empty set is necessarily, the empty set is a subset 
and it's a fixed point of course because if it if it's empty to begin with when you act by group the group elements there is nothing you can act on so the result is again empty okay and the whole set g that's again invariant because uh, that's a fixed point because when you hit every element of the group g by some fixed element small g what you get is again elements of the group g okay so it's trivial that the the whole set is necessarily a fixed point okay so here's the conclusion there are only two fixed points for the action on the power set which is the empty set and the whole set okay so this is almost fixed point free it's not quite fixed point free there are these two sort of trivial fixed points but there is this uh, sort of example 3 is a slight modification of of this, this earlier argument uh, let's consider not uh, the entire power set so let me call this um, uh, this set instead of the set y uh, let me fix also a number okay uh, what shall we we call it let's call it um, uh, so okay so I have the cardinality of the group here so remember the cardinality of the group was something we assume the cardinality of the group looks like this p to the dm okay so let me pick some number k between 1 and uh, strictly smaller than the cardinality of the group okay or maybe the sort of a symmetrical way to write it is I take k to be a natural number which is strictly between 0 and the cardinality of the group okay then look at what I will call y sub k okay so let us define this set called y sub k well what is this so maybe another notation so let me also give another name for this uh, it is the p so the power set of g with k as my, my subscript pkg so what is pkg it is the set of all subsets of g whose cardinality is k okay of a fixed cardinality and again remember this is again something we have seen in the the earlier uh, video on uh, the congruence problem where we took all dots so we took a grid of 12 dots and we looked at all subsets of 6 dots out of the 12 dots okay so we fix a cardinality of the subsets and observe that there is of course a group action also on pkg okay so observe g acts the action on subsets also gives you an action of the group g on the set pkg okay so there is an action of g on pkg why the same thing so how does it act when g acts on a subset a it just gives you the element wise action which in this case is just left multiplication so let's just write it as g a the product as a belongs to a and this new set of course has the same cardinality as the original set because I have just taken element by element and acted on them by um, you know left multiplied by group element g. So this is just going to give me the original thing okay. So if the original set had uh, k elements the new set will have k elements also so it will be another element of pkg okay. So what I have now is the action of a group on subsets of cardinality k and now observe that if k is strictly between 0 and cardinality g okay then what does that mean it means that the subsets a that i am considering here so pkg the subsets a i am not if, i mean if i took, took k equal to 0 then p0 is just the it con contains only the empty set and if i took k to be the other end uh, mod g itself then the only subset in pkg will be the full set okay now for k strictly between these two bounds I have pkg consists of subsets which are you know non-empty and not the whole proper subsets and we have just seen that none of those can be a fixed point okay. So observe uh, by what we have just said so by this observation before by observation star it follows that for k strictly between these two numbers pkg has no fixed points okay so here's a fixed point free action has no g fixed points okay so we have we have managed to find uh, an example of of something which has no g fixed points and uh, remember however that so let us go back to what we wanted to prove. We wanted to prove um, that there exists 
a subset need to construct a finite G set X such that it there are no fixed points. So, that we have managed to do now, right? take a group G and look at PKG for example, where K is any number between 0 and mod G. That is a fixed point free action, but remember there is this additional condition. I also want my set uh, to have cardinality that is not divisible by P. Okay? So, now let us look at this, this set that we have managed to construct uh, right here, which is what I call PKG. So, now what can I say about the cardinality of PKG? Is it divisible by P or not? I would like it not to be divisible by P, right? If I can find a value of K for some value of K, if this is not divisible by P, then I have done, I have proved my proposition, okay? Um, for let, let's just say for what value of K is it not divisible by P? Is there a value of K? So, is there a value of K for which the cardinality of PKG, let's make ourselves more space. So, is there a value of K for which the cardinality of PKG is not divisible by P? Okay. And to answer this, we need that second observation that we talked about. So, let us ask ourselves what is the cardinality of PKG? Well, that is exactly cardinality of G choose K, right? Number of ways of choosing K elements out of mod G elements. And remember what is uh, the thing on top going to look like? It is P to the D M, that is the what we assumed is the cardinality of G uh, choose K, okay? Now, what I want to do is to try and use that, that proposition. So, let me take the following value of K. So, let me take K to be um, let us say P for instance. Okay? So, I mean we could start with various uh, choices of K, but let us take K to be well maybe how about K equals 1 that is the most obvious choice. right? So, let us try a few values of K. If you take K to be 1 then this is P to the D choose M uh, sorry P to the D M choose 1 which is P to the D M itself. Well, this is divisible by P because there is of course a P to the D in front. right? So, that is no good that value of K is not going to help me. Let me try the next one, which is P itself. Well, I'm going to try P. Now look at this. So P to the D M choose P. So I will put this into the form of the the earlier um, result. So it is P to the D M choose P into one. So I will write it as P times P to the D minus one M choose P times one. Okay, and which by the earlier result is congruent to P to the D minus 1 M choose 1 mod P. Okay, now, let us look at this. It is P to the D minus 1 M choose 1, but that is just by definition P to the D minus 1 M mod P. Okay, and now, this again is well, this is could be 0 mod P because P to the D minus 1 is probably still some you know some power of P but it is already better than the original, right? The original guy was P to the D M. Now, I managed to get it down to P to the D minus 1 M. Okay? And now, you can see that all it takes now is to repeat this argument. So, let us repeat this argument. Uh, the value of K that will do the trick for us is P to the D. So, here is the chain of computation. So, if I have P to the D M choose P to the D, I can think of it as I will pull out a P from both P to the D minus 1 M, P to the D minus 1 and by that proposition, by that result, it is P to the D minus 1 M choose P to the D minus 1, okay, mod P. Now again, this is, uh, this is in the same form as the original. I can keep going therefore. Again, I will pull out a P from both the thing on the top and on the bottom and I will get this to be P to the D minus 2 M choose P to the D minus 2 mod p and so on and so forth till all the p's have been pulled out one by one and what is on top is m and what is on the bottom is 1. So, this is m choose 1 mod p which is of course just m. Okay, So, observe this is nothing but m mod p. Okay, so, what have we, we proved? p to the d m 
choose p to the d is congruent to m mod p and m remember was a number that's not divisible by p okay so but p doesn't divide m that was our assumption that's what m was and m was a number that was two or more okay so what does that mean i mean i don't really care about um, uh, ah no i do so let's say m here is a number that's that's two or more uh, that was our assumption that g was not a p group so this means that uh, this this number p to the d m choose p to the d is congruent to a number that's not so it's not congruent to zero mod p it's not divisible by p I mean, at the moment, let me not worry about this m greater than or equal to 2 business. So, all I know, all I care about is that m is not divisible by p. Okay? That means that neither is this p to the d m choose p to the d. Okay. So, what have we done? We have, we have actually managed to do what we wanted that we have constructed. Uh, we seem to have constructed uh, a set on which this group G acts without fixed points. Okay. Therefore, final conclusion is the following that under the assumption, so if G is not a P group, look at the set, the power set of G, subsets of G of G of cardinality exactly P power D. Okay, So, let us say cardinality of G looks like P power D times M, okay, P does not divide M. Then, what we have shown is that the action of G on this set uh, has no fixed points. Okay, but uh, we seemingly have not used uh, the fact that M is at least 2, but we actually have used it. So, observe that I, I also assume, so G can be written in this way, P not dividing M, M is at least 2, right, because it is not a P group. Where have we used it? So, observe this has no fixed points that that requires that, uh, you know, remember what did I say before? I said the power set PKG, the action of G on the on the power set PKG has no fixed points, provided K is strictly between 0 and the cardinality of G. Okay, so I, I need this strict inequality here. Now, why is that inequality strict in this case? So, if I take k to be p to the d and mod g is p to the d m. Now, this inequality is strict because m is at least 2. Okay, That is why it is true. So, I am actually looking at proper subsets. Subsets of cardinality of p power d are actually proper subsets of the group. They cannot, they are not the entire group itself because p to the d is in fact strictly smaller than the, the full cardinality of the group. Okay? So, therefore, we have managed to prove, therefore, this proves proposition B. Proposition B is proved. In other words, we have managed to prove uh, uh, a nice converse to our, to our original result. So, let me go back and show you the statement of proposition B. So, here is what we have managed to prove, okay? which is that if a prime divides the cardinality of a group and suppose uh, it is true that for all G sets X said that P does not divide its cardinality, there is a fixed point, then this group had better be a P group. Okay.